They create the idea of genius by being geniuses. <laughs> it's a chicken and egg situation. I think if there's one thing that survives from the Renaissance in art, it's just the idea of the artists. And the idea that artists are special, that artists are cool, that artists are... Being an artist is a great thing to be. That, that de idea definitely was invented in the Renaissance. Thanks for meeting up to discuss your book. It's, um, I thought it was a fantastically well-researched and written book, and it was so beautifully illustrated. Thanks for that. And Cheers. I just thought we Thank could um, just a few questions about it, really. What, what made you want to write it? I've always loved Renaissance art. It was the first art I fell in love with. It was um, that's the kind of question that is, if I, if I talk too much about my early life, just stop me. It's the kind of question that invite, you know what I mean? You've got these stories. But basically, um, I grew up in North Wales. Uh, my parents were school teachers. Um, I was, didn't really, there were no art galleries really or museums, you know, where we lived. I had a very good education, but art was not really a big part of it. Except, I think when I was 11, um, my dad decided to drive to Italy in the summer holidays. Uh, teachers have decent summer holidays. They're not that well paid, but they do have decent summer holidays. So we, we I didn't, and, and he liked driving. So we basically drove to Italy. And, and so the first places that I saw art were Florence and Rome. Um, so I was, as a child, my introduction to art was, you know, Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo. Um, and, and then I saw an exhibition. The first exhibition I went to was in Florence as well. But there was an exhibition at the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, and we happened to be there on holiday. And it was Leonardo da Vinci's anatomical drawings from the Royal Collection, in, actually from Britain, from Windsor, belonged to the, the Queen at that time. Um, and they had a, I've still got the battered catalogue with an introduction by Anthony Blunt, who, who was, you know, keeper of the Queen's pictures and a spy. And this is, I think, just before he was exposed as a spy. Anyway, but Leonardo, so I saw, like, it's unbelievable. I mean, my whole idea of art was formed by this kind of thing. Um, and, and I've never seen... Some people see the Renaissance as sort of conservative and, you know, authoritarian, traditional and classical, and, and, and they oppose it to contemporary art and to modern art. And I've never seen it that way because my introduction to, to it was yes, Leonardo's anatomical drawings, you know. The, I, you know, they're, a, I think, a, a big inspiration to Damien Hirst. Like, you know, these visceral, extraordinary. I mean, Leonardo was dissecting human bodies in the hospital in Florence, Santa Maria Nuova Hospital, which is still a functioning hospital. He was dissecting bodies. He was studying anatomy. He was seeing things in them that no scientist had ever seen before. He was, you know, centuries ahead scientifically but also he was producing these unbelievably beautiful sensitive drawings which somehow even though you know the horror in which they're made they're never horrific because they're about they're actually about the beauty of our in our inner landscape when you say you, you started it in 1434 the beginning of the book you say this is the beginning of the renaissance and it's that fantastic portrait of the arnold arnolfini family by van eyck a beautiful painting obviously and, um, but is that, is that really, why is that the beginning of the Renaissance? For a start, it's not in Florence, it's not in Italy, it's from it Northern... Really, yeah. mm, I, I decided, after a lot of thought, um, there are other ways of doing, there are other ways to, to define it, um, and other stories you could tell. But I, I, I very much wanted to tell a story, the pitch, um, that the editor and I sort of decided on together um, in a sort of very sort of interesting lunch, to be honest. <laughs> so we um, um, wanted to do a narrative history of the Renaissance. And that was the idea, to tell a story, to, tell, to write a, a narrative history book, which would tell this as a story that you can, and you read it, and you, you know, it's a gripping story. Um, because I don't think that's been done before like this, in this way. Um, which is quite a bold thing to say, given that people have been writing about the Renaissance since 
the 16th century. <laughs> um, and okay, it has been done before. It was done by Giorgio Vasari in 1550, actually. But anyway, this is so. So, 14, 1434 is the the year that Van Eyck, Jan Van Eyck, uh, completed the Arnolfini portrait and dated it. It's the date is on the painting. He says, you know, Jan van Eyck, on the, on the back wall of the Arnolfini portrait, in the back wall of the room, there's this graffiti. Jan van Eyck was here, 1434. And, and he's literally there because there's also a mirror, um, a convex mirror on the back wall of the room in which you can see two little figures who are at the door of the room. They're, they're, like where, they're standing where we are. And one of them, to judge from that inscription, is actually van Eyck. So his self-portrait is hidden inside the painting. And so why, why? Well, in a way, by explaining that, I've explained why that's the beginning of the Renaissance, because the idea that you could have a painting so precise and so real and so objective that you'd be able to say, Jan van Eyck was here 1434 on the back wall of the room and, and also shows reflection in a the mirror. There'd never been the technology, there'd never been the skills um, and knowledge to produce a painting uh, of a real room, real people in their real house, in a real room, meticulously, surrounded by meticulously convincing everyday objects, you know, fruit on the window ledge, the light streaming through the window in very subtle ways and, you know, reflecting in the mirror and, and, and catching the, the, the bedstead, the, the little dog, <laughs> lovely little dog at their feet, slippers on the floor, everything done in, you know, accurate, in a very, with a strong sense of, of, three, of its three-dimension, three-dimensionality, everything real, and everything, and, 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 and most of all, everything in, in what appears to be a convincing and accurate modelling of actual space, i.e., we look at the picture, the picture is a flat, surface it's a piece of wood at this time people didn't use canvas they painted on wood so the Arnolfini portrait it's on wood it's quite small but you look at this flat piece of wood and you look through it into the illusion of a deep three-dimensional inhabitable space with people in it and living in it um, that miracle is perspective you know, and in Italy, they called it perspective, they called it prospettiva, and they theorised it in, in Renaissance Florence. The reason we associate it most of all with Florence and Italy is because in Florence they theorised this and they were in, really interested in the mathematics of it and, and discussing the mathematics of it and the geometry of perspective. Perspective, it's a kind of science, it's a scientific principle. It's, they, you know, they're saying, well, you know, how, how you, you're in a room or you're, you're in a landscape, how, 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 how do things reduce in size with distance? It's very simple, <laughs> and yet at the same time, definitely a mathematical construct. So you they actually would calculate, you know, how big that tree, which is half a mile away, how, should that, how big should that be compared to the hut that's um, a mile away or whatever, you know, or the mountains that are 10 miles away. And the, this fascination, and, the, and it was a fascination, it, was, it really was to create the illusion of a deep, real, li living space behind the picture, within the picture, so that the, the flat surface becomes a window pane and you're looking through a window. I mean, I love that portrait, the Arnolfini portrait, but, and I also love the, um, the Earthly Delights, the, the Bosch painting, but that doesn't seem, obviously you've titled your book after it, but that painting doesn't seem, maybe I'm wrong, but it's almost surrealistic, that painting. It's quite a different type of painting to the realism of mm. the Arnold Fiend. Ah, well, yeah. Um, right, yeah, I mean, this is it's sort of deliberately provocative that I put, you know, make Bosch, because it's, it's not what people, yeah, none of us, you don't tend to think of Bosch as, as a Renaissance artist. Um, but he is, first of all, chronologically, he definitely is, because he's working... He's almost an exact contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci. So, you know, and that is the time when, that is absolutely the time of the high, the high what people call the high Renaissance. It's the era of Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael in Italy. So, and, and this is what's, and Bosch is doing this stuff that looks to us like mad, surrealist, medieval craziness. Um, but 
it's not just that. It's the thing about the thing about, and this is about how I want to sort of shake up how people see Renaissance art. It's not, you know, obviously you say perspective. Okay, we'll agree on that. But what's amazing is the things they do with that perspective. It's like a it's like a new technology. Once they work out how to do it, it's a new technology, uh, and you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. So Bosch wouldn't be able to do what he does in his paintings. His paintings are these bonkers um, panoramas of, 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 ludicrous, of ludicrous monsters and, and bizarre goings on and fantastical um, hellish torments and also in the Garden of Earthly Lights, wonderful ecstatic liberation in the central panel, which is what fascinates me. Um, and I think he, but he, so we, you know, we might see that just because we're used to this, we, we just see it as the content almost. We don't, what we don't notice, and they did notice in the Renaissance, is how the landscapes are beautiful. He's, he's a beautiful painter, and, 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 he, and he creates a real space. He couldn't do this. He couldn't have painted the Garden of Earthly Delights, for instance, without being able to do perspective. It's in perspective. It's a real space. He even does what Leonardo da Vinci called aerial perspective, which is to capture the mistiness of the sky at a distance, you know, to show how the, the horizon is misty. Um, he's, so he's, a, he's completely on top of all the, of the Renaissance magic of perspective, in fact. Uh, and he's also a realist. You say real, he is a realist because his, his fantasy works through acute realism. That's actually what I argue. What he does is to very accurately, just like Van Eyck, he very accurately portrays everyday things like clogs, the things around him, as somebody in you know, low, the, the, the lowlands of uh, southern, what's today is southern Holland, uh, Brabant. He... Um, so he, the clogs, the windmills, and then you know knives and pots and pans. He depicts all these things with a meticulous objectivity and realism. But then he fuses them, he melds them, sutures them with things that they shouldn't. You don't expect to see them to be attached to. So a bird has a metal funnel on its head and wears ice skates, and it's delivering a letter in its beak. So all of which are real things, including the bird. But put them together, and they become the surreal. Which he's a fantasist, but he depicts it really, very realistically. That's right. Yeah, yeah, um, and and which, and that, that's actually that they had. That's how they that's how they made monsters in the Renaissance and in the mid, late Middle Ages. They other artists like Martin Schongauer. Martin Schongauer did an incredible print, which had a huge influence on on Renaissance art. So he's a, obviously a German artist, and he did this this print in the 15th century of the t Temptations of Saint Anthony, with all these monsters flying in the sky and all the, the you know the, the, the demonic, monstrous demons that are menacing this poor saint, um, and that's a theme that recurs in lots of North European art, um, and and it, it, you create the monsters by putting real things together, you, you know, a bird's wing um, with a snake's head, chicken, a chicken leg, which is rather horrible, put, it, put that together with, with bits of a bat, you know. Um, that's how they did it. So, so this, from, from reality, you produce fantasy. And that's, that's what I love about Renaissance art, that it, they, 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 they invent this machine perspective for showing the world much more realistically than it had ever been done before. Um, not even the ancient Greeks and Romans had got this. Um, and so, but they use it, that doesn't produce a sort of predictable drab reality at all because, they're, they're, because they're, their mental universe is full of strange things. You know, heaven, you know, this is people believe in heaven and hell, but then they add, they add in, they also add in the, a, a different mythology, the mythology of the ancient Greek Greeks and Romans, part, part of what we all think of as the Renaissance perhaps is the revival of the classics, the rediscovery of ancient Rome and ancient Greece, which had, was even earlier than Rome and the Romans were influenced by Greece. So, you know, all the, the great myths like, you know, and the goddesses and gods, Venus and Mars, all that comes back and that, that Italian art very much brings that in. But that's another kind of fantastic 
So on the one hand, you've got the kind of the late medieval, the medieval um, landscape of Christian imagination, which an artist like Bosch in the North draws on, and he twists it into heretical, bizarre directions to say, I think, very, very new and extraordinary things. So on the one hand, in a northern artist like Bosch draws on the imagination of Christianity, of heaven and hell, to depict worlds of intense imagination and, and of heresy, actually. In Italy, and what this is where Italy is, Italy, right? <laughs> this is what, what they do first, before anyone else, is to look at these old manuscripts that were in monastery libraries and at all the fragments of Roman art, which actually are all over the place in Italy, which wasn't hard for them to find that stuff. It was all around them. Uh, so they, they revived pagan, basically pagan, pre-Christian pagan thought and myth and art. And so, so there, and then the realism, the, the, the power of perspective and the power of artistic discovery, you know, lets them bring the, the pagan gods back to life and pagan monsters. In a way you said the Renaissance is the birth of, um, of the individual in, in our way. And there's two things in your book and you, you know, describe them so well, or maybe three things I'd like to touch upon. One is the Reformation, we'll come back to that. But the other is, is, is how, it, how it changed sex or the portrayal of sex, because it seemed to be extraordinary that suddenly you could have sex being depicted and even put in churches and things. That's one thing. And the other, uh, not necessarily a connected thing, but what was the importance of the Renaissance for women? So they're the two questions. If yeah, I yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, sex, sex is, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think they're pretty kind of sex mad in the Renaissance. And um, uh, this, actually, the, like, you know, the very first chapter of my book, yes, I talk about the Arnolfini portrait by Yavanite, Knight, but the chapter's actually called the Arnolfini nude. And, and what set it off and this is something I learned, so it's something I disagree with. Set, yeah, actually set the whole book on a new direction, in fact, when I was researching it. When I, when I started to think about the fact that Jan van Eyck was actually famous for painting nudes, none of his nudes today survive, but there are copies of one of them. And it looks incredibly familiar because it seems to be in the same house or the same room even as the Arnolfini portrait. And so I say I call it the Arnolfini nude, and I even speculate that the woman in it, the woman who's bathing with a servant attending her, that she's actually could even be the woman in the Arnolfini portrait, which would imply that she's not perhaps the wife, but that this is something, something more. It's very mysterious, the Arnolfini portrait. You know, there are no documents about it to, to tell say who everyone is. You know, even the identification of Arnolfini is something that's been, you know, it's agreed, but you know, it's anyway. So and I even started thinking, and I tentatively suggested in the book that, that it could, could even be heretical, that there was a heresy, or, or certainly the church believed there was a heresy called the Brethren of, of, of the Free Spirit, who believed that they were sort of chosen by God and that they were so full of the Holy Spirit that they could not sin and they would go around deliberately you know, having orgies and having, having free love, making free love and having sex, as much sex as they liked, uh, because they couldn't sin, they were beyond sin. Yeah, so, so I, you know, I even suggest kind of quite tentatively that, that Van Eyck, there could be a heresy going on, that Arnold Feeney and Van Eyck might be heretics who actually believe in maybe in free love or, or in, you know, very odd, not odd, but you know, quite liberating and radical things. Uh, and, and the funny thing is that I, that was, I mean, I thought, I put it quite carefully, but when I talked to a Renaissance, you know, we started giving talks about the book and sharing the book, I found that Renaissance scholars were, were not anything like as shocked as I thought they would be by that. Uh, everyone, people seem to think that's actually quite a reasonable idea. So, and, and, and but, but that is, you know, and it's obviously partly my own, I personally find, you know, I love looking at uh, Titian's, <laughs> Titian's nudes. Uh, and, and, and I think, 
again, it's one of the things that make Renaissance art contemporary and modern and shocking and provocative. In fact, people can still, obviously some people can still be unsettled by how much nudity there is in Renaissance art. Maybe not more now than sort of 10 years ago because we're in an age, we're, we're in an age when, you know, critique, feminist critiques of nudity are, 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 are quite, you know, familiar to us. And so, you know, seeing a massive, incredible a painting like the Venus of Urbino by Titian um, can be, well, that's problematic or something. To me, what that means is that it's alive. If Renaissance art can still be provocative and, and something you want to argue with and debate, that's extraordinary. Um, so, but, it, but, but I, their drive, they have a drive to depict the, the naked human body female and male but, and you know um just recently i saw michelangelo's david again i mean it's incredible i mean this is like a giant colossal naked male body um what's going on done with incredible sensuality and, and love and michelangelo this is the thing they, they the renaissance this is why i mean it's, it's it, it was a liberation michelangelo didn't deny that he loved the male form. You know, he said he'd been accused of loving the male form in a carnal way. And he said, well, you know, yes, he does love the male form, but he loves it in the same way as Socrates, who, and he, and he makes reference to Plato's philosophy. Michelangelo was very clever. <laughs> he was very learned. He was very learned in, in ancient uh, thought and, and poetry. You know, he wrote his poetry. So, um, so basically, Michelangelo was not only what we would call gay, but he found a way to, to make that public because he used the idea of platonic love in order to say, well, yes, but it's platonic. But, it, you, and, you know, you can sort of... Uh, some people think that's just total, totally untrue. I think, I, think, I, think there is, I think his life, he went through different phases. I think at the time when he created David, he was quite young, and I think... He might have been chased, and he's putting it all in his art. He's putting all this passion, all this quite turbulent passion, perhaps confused passion and guilt-stroking passion into a massive male nude work of art. Um, and um, <laughs> I, I come up with ideas about Renaissance art that sometimes I'm actually embarrassed to even say. Okay, um, <laughs> there's some stuff, though. <laughs> but but uh, the other day, the other day in Florence, looking at Michelangelo, he's got a huge. Ha his right hand is huge. It's out of proportion, and it's, you know, and it's why is that? And he's got the stone. He, you know, he's got the stone in his hand that he's going to put into his sling and fire at Goliath. But it's also quite near to his. To his testicles, it's quite near to his, to his groin, and this huge hand. And I just first I think, is it about? Is there also? Is it masturbation? Is it about masturbation? <laughs> Sorry, you see what I mean? I have these. I mean, I could, you can never. Um, but I think, yeah, I genuinely think there's genuinely a lot going on in Michelangelo's David that's um, dangerous and, and wondrous. And would you get into why it's so alive? The thing about the danger. One of the, I think, well, yeah, one of the reasons they embrace sexuality in art in a way that had never been done before, and arguably hasn't even been done since in some ways, because um, they're so uninhibited about it and so non-judgmental about it. Um, but it, you know, to do with making art alive, the thing about David is it's a statue that seems alive. You can't ever, you can, it's hard to, it's almost hard to, in the end, all you come away with, you come away with this awe and also this sense that you've in, somehow encountered a living being rather than just seeing a lump and statue. Um, and sexuality is, the sexuality is part of that. It's electrifying, you know, it's an ele electrifying, life-giving force. Um, but also with Michelangelo's David, he's also, I think, dealing with something which, um, an earlier work, so one of the first, the nude in the Renaissance, the first, the first uh, kind of electrifying nude in Renaissance art is Donatello's statue of David, which was done in 15th century Florence for the Medici. Um, and it's, and it, I saw that again. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a major thing in my book. In my, and in my book, I argue that Donatello, well, Donatello, the, the, there are contemporary sources that say, Don, that describe Donatello as being gay, as having, as having relationships with his apprentices. Um, there's, a particular, there's a particular story that was told 
you know, in the 15th century um, about that Donatello's apprentice, he was in love with his apprentice, so he's basically his boyfriend, but his boyfriend runs away to another city and he goes to Cosimo de' Medici, the richest man in Europe, and he says, you know, I want you, I want you to write me a kind of a letter because I've got to go to this place, I'm going to kill him. So I want you to give me a kind of cover letter so that they'll, you know, I'll be able to do this. Um, and instead Cosimo says, all right, but he gives him, a, actually he gives a letter that's it's for the Prince of Duke of Ferrara. And, and, and it says, you know, look after this artist. He's very sensitive. He's in love. He's angry with his lover. And, 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 and so what happens is that he does go and he meets the apprentice, Donatello meets the apprentice and instead of killing him, they fall into each other's arms <laughs> laughing. Uh, so, but not only, but the story, the, obviously the story implies not only doesn't, not only implies, you know, not, says clearly that Donatello is in love with his, his, his male apprentice, but that everyone tolerates this and accepts this, that no one has a problem with this. Um, and I think that's partly to do with the idea of the, this, this was well, to be, this is why I say it's, the Renaissance is subverting, they're discovering earthly delights and subverting and rejecting um, Christian tradition. Because obviously, obviously this, this was a society, that, the crime of sodomy, which is what it was called, it was, not, it was a, a mortal sin. You know, it's a mortal sin in Christianity. Um, Christianity is still confused about these issues. Uh, and you could be burned at the stake for it. So... Donatello and Michelangelo are dealing, uh, putting stuff into a public space, which um, was very dangerous, and yet, and yet, and yet they didn't have, and it, people didn't have a problem. So partly because it all gets twined up with the cult of the artist, so artists can do can get away with things that other people can't get away with. I think Burkhardt said that um, women were liberated in the Renaissance. So what does that mean, How, if, if, if you agree well, with Well, it? obviously Burkhardt was writing in the 19th century <laughs> and their idea of women being liberated <laughs> was, I mean, it was before true. women had the vote, you know. Yeah. Um, however, I'm a lot more, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I do feel more positive about the lives of women in the Renaissance than, 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 than some people are. Um, one thing I definitely argue for um, in, 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 in this book is that um, women were certainly viewers of Renaissance art. I mean, I think it's a cliche to think that Renaissance paintings were all made for a male viewer and incorporate a kind of male gaze. Because in, 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 in early Renaissance Florence, one of the first um, genres of art in which in which the classical gods and goddesses start coming back, um, and nudity, um, were things called, they're called um, birth trays. In English, they're called birth trays. We call them birth trays. Um, and these trays were made for, to bring food, to bring restorative foods, sweet meats to, um, to women who just had a baby. Obviously, in, in, this, we're talking about here about the elite. Obviously, we're talking about wealthy households. Um, but you would commission a special tray it's like a it became like a commemorative tray because it'd be kept in the family. So you'd actually commission an artist to paint something on the tray. But the first audience for that painting would be the group of women that, that childbirth was an all-female ritual. Um, so there would be, you know, the, 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 the mother and her friends and midwives, but they would all be women. And there's paintings of, you know, there, there are some wonderful paintings of, of childbirth scenes, you know, sort of the birth of the Virgin, the birth of St. John the Baptist. Um, and uh, and in Florence, so in Florence, that, this was the ritualised thing of childbirth. Obviously, it was a massively, there was no medicine, there was no, you know, this was a very dangerous moment for mother and child, um, and often really, often ended in, you know, tragic, tragically. However, if, if it went well, and if, if you know if mother and child survived, then they they you get the, the image of them sitting around eating the fruit, and as they ate the fruit, the painting would be revealed. And these paintings are fascinating. And one of them I have that I've illustrated is um, was only about fourteen hundred, and it's like one of the very first depictions of the goddess Venus, um, and she's floating in the air, 
and then she's surrounded by men who are kind of, a, you know, they're kind of struck down, they're kind of magically in awe um, in the power of Venus. Venus is up there and the men are all down below. Not only that, but there were rays of, a gold rays um, shooting out of her, her vagina. Um, so the men are like straight into the men's eyes. Uh, and so it's, it's like, you know, an image of, it's an image of, so that's, and that's not, so that's an image of, of female sexuality as something powerful and, um, you know, very powerful, in fact. And it's not only that, but it was clearly made for the eyes of women, that the women were the audience for that painting, the first audience. Um, and there's also, you know, in fact, there are women, women, women could be patrons in other ways. Um, Isabella d'Este, who was the Marchioness of Mantua, she was one of the great art patrons of the Renaissance. And she, um, she worked with, she created a, a, a her own kind of collection of she commissioned paintings of mythology in Mantua, um, but she also got Leonardo da Vinci and Bellini and Giorgione to, or she tried to get to work for her, um, and a less like a more unlikely and less well known, a less respectable form of artistic patronage in which I think women were central um, was in Venice. That um, in Venice. There are these paintings, portraits of courtesans, prostitutes, high, you know, expensive, you know, sort of, which Venice was, Venice was famous for its sex trade. And um, it, it, so anyway, there are paintings by Titian and Giorgione, fantastic paintings, um, and also by sort of lesser Venetian artists. Um, of women, they're often portrayed as flora. If you see a woman portrayed as flora in Venetian art, it's a kind of, I mean, I think, you know, in the, in the Victorian age or even probably in the 19, quite recently, people would have put that very respectably and said, oh, flora is an image of spring. Or, but flora was also associated with the Floralia, which is an ancient Roman festival in which sex workers, it was the festival of sex workers in ancient Rome. So Flora is like the goddess of sex workers. So, so if, if a woman is holding a flower, uh, and she's, you know, the, and she <laughs> is sort of a, you know, and also, especially as these kind of flaunting sexuality, as it were, chances are she, it, this actually is a painting of a courtesan. And in fact, there was an English traveler who went to Venice at the time of Shakespeare, and he raves about, he gets, he gets, he gets very, very, very steamed up about all this, about, about the, oh, because Venice was famous for, um, you know, having sort of, the, you, you, so you, you, he says you go and visit a courtesan and have her room is, you know, kitted out in beautiful velvets and it can be plush and rich. So it looks like the setting of a Titian painting, you know, it's, a, and this is obviously, so that's cultural history, you've got to look at what people find, what people found erotic in, in the 16th century, obviously, you know, lovely velvet bedspreads. And <laughs> but also, there'll be a painting of her on the wall. So in other words, that, that pa these paintings could have been put where it looks like they were actually part of, that they were commissioned by the women, that the women commissioned the paintings, or maybe their lovers commissioned the paintings, but, that, you know, but, 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 but arguably, they commissioned the paintings, and they used the paintings as, like, for advertisement. It's like, you know, they're, glam they're glamorizing themselves as part of the, that, that trade. Um, and, the, the, and not only that, but these, there's an amazing painting, there's one of these paintings by Palma Vecchio that's in the National Gallery. And there's another painting by Palma Vecchio of, of a nude Venus, which is in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. They're the same woman, it's the same woman. And, and I think that is a clue to what what's happening in Venetian paintings by Giorgione and Titian, that obviously they're, they're, they, they paint the nude, they, they, you know, the female nude, they take the female nude to incredible, you know, artistic heights and, you know, um, but these, these, these real women, the courtesans, are probably their models. Who else would be? In your book, you start with the Renaissance in 1434 with the Arnold Feeney portrait, and you also, end with the Caravaggio of 1608, I think, that um, the Cupid yeah. painting, which is an amazing painting too. And why is that the ending of it in your eyes? Okay, 
Um, so I see the Renaissance as a, you know, essentially as, as an explosion of curiosity and free thought and free, free lifestyles as well, to some, you know, in certain circles. Um, a liberation, a mental, a cultural liberation, precociously modern, we might say. Um, but was it the beginning of the modern world? Was it, oh, now that, this is where I would differ from Burkhardt or the 19th century liberal historians. He saw the Renaissance as the beginning of, se of a secular modern world. So for Burkhardt, you have the, the Renaissance and then it's a linear rise from that to a liberal, 19th century liberal society. Um, but that's not what happened because it, it ended it was, it was like this great liberating period, but it, but it ended, and it ended because it ended it all got, because of religion. I mean, they couldn't buck religion. Christianity, this was still, most people, you know, very, well, you know, it was a Christian world. So even though they're, even though they're complicating that by bringing in pagan gods and they're finding ways to go away from them all, this kind of repressive medieval Christendom, and they can't change the fact that, you know, religion is still... And, and there's a good reason why religion dominates, because people's lives are, really are miserable and short. Life expectancies are very low. They, this was still... Technologically, this still was the medieval world. Absolutely, the medieval world. And it's just as medieval in 1608 as it had been in 1434. They didn't have industry, of course. They didn't have medicine. They didn't have anything like modern medicine. In, in the world that they inhabited, Christianity was still a very helpful thing to everyone because, you know, in, in the end, their lives were short. They might, you might be killed by plague any minute. Plague was always recurring everywhere. Um, so child mortality was incredible, you know. So, so in the end... You know, Christianity basically makes a big comeback in the 16th century, um, and, and 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 you have the Reformation. The Reformation revolutionized. The Reformation is partly caused by the Renaissance because new ways of thinking and new ways of thinking about texts leads to a total rethink of what Christianity is in Northern Europe. Catholicism then has to respond with what's called the Council Reformation, and that includes saying, "Well, actually, we shouldn't have nudes in churches." It's outrageous. We should religious no <laughs> religious art has to be properly religious art, um, and you know. And so, so in Southern Europe, that turns the clock backwards in many ways, um, and and so by sixteen hundred, art is starting to Italian art is. It's always becoming quite boring. But there's an exception to that, Caravaggio, who turns up in Rome in the 1590s painting, um, painting his, his lovers and male sex workers, prostitutes, with flowers in their hair, like flora. You know, outrageous, actually, completely outrageous. He gets a... But that gets him a reputation. But he doesn't get in trouble for it. Instead, he gets... What he ends up doing is getting religious commissions and becoming the most popular religious painter in Rome until he kills a man and has to flee the city because he's just not, he's not a good man. Um, he's living a wild life. So he kills a man, has to leave the city. Um, and he becomes a knight of Malta, which was, I think, an attempt to reconcile his violent tendencies with with Christianity, I suppose. You know, he's the, the, the Knights of Malta are crusading knights. So he's, um, he's there on Malta. He soon gets into trouble again, gets thrown into, <laughs> gets thrown into prison in Malta. But before that, he paints, um, he paints this, yeah, they're painting the Sleeping Cupid. Um, and it's a very strange, disturbing little painting where the Cupid is in shadow in the night and he's got black wings and he's, his body, he looks more dead than asleep and his body is strangely shaped and misshapen and, and old and unhealthy. Um, 
So it seems to be like sort of the, almost like the death of desire, I suppose. I often think how many great artists, how many genius artists can there be? And I often think, oh, there's probably one every 50 years or every 100 years. You know, we can debate who they are, but there's really one great artist every generation or two. But in the Renaissance, there seems to be a hell of a lot of geniuses there. Is that, would you agree with that? Oh, answer? yeah. Yeah, that would I mean, be another way of defining the Renaissance, that somehow in this very short, well, I treat it as a comparative short space of time. Yeah, from the, basically the 15th to 16th centuries. Yeah, the, the, the pr proliferation of genius is, is just it's bizarre. And there's at least so 10, why? 10, yeah, like at least 10 or 15 yeah. that you could Well, name. yeah, I mean, I mean, the first book I wrote about the Renaissance actually was um, called The Lost Battles, and it was when I discovered that, I, I just reading Vasari, I realized I, I'd, I'd never thought of Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo as being people who knew each other. So. So Leonardo and Michelangelo, yeah, loathed each other. They lived at the same time. How does that happen? How do you get, you know, two geniuses of that order? And also Raphael at that same, at that same period in Florence. Um, around about 1504, Raphael is in Florence as well. He doesn't come from Florence, but he's... I mean, they both come from Florence, Leonardo and Michelangelo, same city. Um, and Raphael from Umbria, he's there learning from them, observing them. Um, Botticelli is, is still alive at that moment. So, so yeah, how do you get such a concentration yeah. of genius? How does that, I mean, what? Yeah, what it's another the, way of defining what the Renaissance was, was, yeah. it, was this period that produced a particular, you know, what, not only what, the idea of genius, but the reality of it. Well, I mean, what would trigger that cluster of geniuses to sprout out? What, what triggers that? Yeah. I mean, okay, uh, I do have a theory. Um, I sort of, I think I say it in the book. <laughs> uh, I certainly um, I hope it emerges. I think, yeah, I mean, it's a period, it's between two worlds. Um, well, actually, it's between two worlds, many worlds. But this thing about the Middle Ages and then the modern world, um, what happens that in the 17th century, you get Isaac Newton, you get Galileo, Isaac Newton, you get scientific, the scientific revolution, you get the emergence of a, a modern rationalist mindset in which people start to see the difference between the supernatural and the natural and so that like in the early 17th century witches are being burned and hanged regularly by the end of the 17th century hardly any witches are killed because people have stopped believing in witches and they stop believing in you know that the supernatural is all around they don't believe in the supernatural in the same way it's by, eight, by 1700. Now, during the Renaissance, that hasn't happened yet. So, you, but you've got these extraordinary leaps forward in terms of artistic ability and representation, like in, in visual art perspective, as I said, you know, you've got perspective. Perspective sort of influences the, that, that has, comes into drama as well, into the world of Shakespeare, because, the, you know, the stage, the stage itself, the, becomes a kind of, um, yeah, it's a sort of perspective space. And, and, um, but also the revival of the classic, the, this revival of classical learning gives, you know, sparks all kinds of new ideas in, in literature and, and, in, and in thinking. Um, the other thing, of course, which I haven't, which I talk about, in fact, is central to the book, but I haven't said much about it yet, is um, the discover the Christopher Columbus sailing to the New World in 1492. And then Amerigo Vespucci from Florence going, following after him and realising that he's actually discovered a new continent, uh, the new world, America, which is named after Amerigo Vespucci. Uh, so there's that. So there's all this, all this new stuff and radical new stuff happening in the Renaissance. And, 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 and so artistically, there the tech, that's a, what I call the technology, the technologies of perspective and... Um, and, 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 and of new, classically influenced forms of writing. These are all amazing. But at the same time, they still believe in a world of... They still believe that the world is a very magical place. It's not been rationalised yet. So, you know, they do believe in magic. Magic actually has a golden age in the Renaissance. <laughs> they did... The, 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 you know, the, um, they're really into magic. 
Um, on the one hand, they're scared, there's the fear of witches, although that actually really comes in as the Renaissance is dying, actually. It's really a phenomenon of the, the end of the Renaissance, the, you know, the witch craze and the, the, the persecutions of witches, so-called witches. Uh, but they believe the world is full of demon, angels and demons and spirits and magical forces. So if you've got these you know, very you know, modern, as it were, powerful means of portraying and depicting you know, and thinking about the world, and at the same time you believe in magic, I think that's a, that's a great combination for imaginative art. They create the idea of genius by being geniuses. <laughs> it's a chicken and egg situation. Because obviously you could do a kind of postmodern thing about this, oh, the Renaissance constructs the idea of the genius, and the, blah, 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 you know what I mean, make it sound very sort of, oh yes, you know, it's like this thing that they construct. They are geniuses. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci, <laughs> no, you know, if anybody deserves, the, you know, the, the, you can't really quarrel with the idea that Leonardo da Vinci was a genius. And, and Leonardo becomes crucial to that idea. I mean, it was Leonardo really, really takes the idea of genius to another level because he starts, well, first of all, he wasn't, didn't, wasn't just an artist. He was an inventor and a scientist. Um, and he, you know, he does, produces notebooks full of, full of inventions and does anatomical research, you know, you know, just does all of this. He's, he's, he's a, so it's, but not only that, but he did this thing of not finishing his works. So when he was, when he was in Milan, he's at the court of Milan, he, you know, he spent years working on a great bronze statue of a horse, but he never finished it. He never cast it. It just, it became, and there are lots of drawings in which he's, he, he just obsesses about the technology of, casting and how he's going to make a great machinery in order to cast the horse beautiful beautiful drawings where he so instead of a finished work of art the horse becomes a kind of great project um at the same time he's also trying to fly and make flying machines at the same time as that um and you know even his paintings um very few are ever finished um but that becomes part of his almost his um that becomes part of his fame at the time there's a when he, first, he, went, he goes back to Florence then, um, beginning of the 16th century, and he's now famous. He's done the Last Supper, so he's very famous. And so the Florentines ask him to do a painting in, in, in one of the churches. Uh, he never finishes that, but, it's, but he does do a, a drawing for it, a full-size drawing, a cartoon. And Vasari says, you know, that hundreds of people queued to see the drawing, the cartoon, in other words, to see something from the mind of Leonardo da Vinci. So Leonardo is the first artist who is recognised for his mind. What people want to see is sort of Leonardo's concepts and his imagination. Um, and then Michelangelo, sort of, who has it, you know, actually did have a competition with Leonardo, knew Leonardo, he learns, he sort of learns from that. And, he start, and suddenly he starts leaving things unfinished and... <laughs> Although he was very capable of finishing things when he wanted to, but but Michelangelo Michelangelo becomes the the self conscious genius where he's a sculptor, a poet, a painter, an architect. Let me ask you, what what's the relevance to us now, or say to contemporary? I mean, obviously you know I live my life in contemporary art in a way. So, so do you? What's the relevance of the Renaissance to contemporary art? Well, uh, the first place would be what we've been talking about, the idea of the genius. I think if there's one thing that survives from the Renaissance in art, it's just the idea of the artists, and the idea that artists are special, that artists are cool, that artists are, being an artist is a great thing to be. That, that de idea definitely was invented in the Renaissance. Well, thanks very much for that. I, I love reading your book, and I love meeting you and talking to you about Thank it you. too. Thank you. Quite yeah, inspiring. it's great. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Oh, Thank you.